and um, I'm going to uh, start then with uh, today's class. Uh, begin by sharing my screen, start going through some processing code. And uh, so let me let me jump right in sharing my screen. OK, here we are. Now we're still finishing up. Some sections of code from last class. And. Um, uh, in this uh, next. Sketch. Uh, we're going to look at an elaboration of uh, if statements. Um, and um, it's not a big complication, I don't think. And but it adds a, a fair amount of power to what how we can use if statements. So let's uh, let's jump right in. And let me that I have this sketch right here. Let me just run the sketch so you can see what's going on, and then I will uh, try to explain the code and we'll uh, see what's going on here. OK, OK, so we have our graphics window, as you can see, and there's a small square here that's going around the perimeter of this graphics window. OK, so how do we get that to work that way? Well, there are four states we have to consider. One is when we're at the top of the window, state one. State two is around the right. State three is the rectangles moving across the bottom. And state four is on the left. And then it's back to state one. So there are four different states. And depending on which of those four states uh, we're in, we execute a different part of the sketch. So we need to have an if statement to check to see which state we're in, and then to make sure that the appropriate part of the sketch is executed. OK, so let me just turn this off now. Let's look at the sketch. OK, call it square following an edge, use a state variable. OK, now we're going to determine the location of the square with the variables X and Y, which we set to be integer right here. And then the speed with which that square moves around the perimeter is another integer variable. OK, so we have these things. Now we need a state. A variable we're going to call it state that keeps track of whether the square is on the top, bottom, left, or right of the uh, graphics window. And so we do void setup to set up the size of the window, void draw with a white background. Now we have a piece of, uh, of the sketch here that actually draws the rectangle. Uh, we set the boundary of the rectangle to be black, the fill to be gray. X and Y determine the X and Y position of the rectangle. And the height and width of it are both nine. So the rectangle is technically a square. Um, now, if the state is zero, we'll say we're at the top of the window. And we're, if we're at the top of the window, um, we want to move to the right. So we change the value, the X position. Um, we take the old X position, add speed to it, which gives us a new X position, and then we put that into the value of the variable X. So this is going to be moving the square to the right. Now notice up here um, that I, I think I'm, I, I don't know if I uh, said it or not. We have another, we have a variable called state, and we initialize state by setting a zero. So we're saying initially the rectangle is going to be at the top of the graphics window. OK, so we check. Is state equals zero? When we begin, it is a zero. If it is zero, then we increment x by the value of speed, which we said earlier. 
Um, if, while the state is zero, it reaches the right side of the window, we change the state to one. So as soon as it gets all the way over to the right, we want that we want that rectangle to move down along the right edge. And so we set the state to one. OK, so let's what do we do here then? If X is greater than width minus nine, remember. We have the width of the window and we're and we have the uh, the width of the square is nine. If X is greater than width minus 10, in other words, that that puts the square all the way over to the right side of the window. Then we are going to change the value of X, OK, to the. Two width minus 10, so we're moving the X coordinate of the square so that it's sitting right at the right edge of the window. And then we change state to one. So if we go, to, if the rectangle goes all the way over to the right edge and starts to run off, <clears throat> we're, we make sure that the X position is such that it's, it has enough room there with width X equals width minus 10. So now it'll follow that right edge when, as it goes down with X equal fixed. Now X, the X position is fixed, the width minus 10. We set the state equal one. Now, when we go through the loop and we say the state equals zero, it's not gonna be zero anymore, it's gonna be one. And when because it's not zero, it skips over this whole section of code that goes from here <clears throat> to here. Then it executes this. It says else if state equals one, which it will be right now. It executes this block of code from here to here. <clears throat> and in this block of code, it increments the value of Y by speed. OK, now it <clears throat> keeps doing that. Here it checks to see are we at the bottom of the window? <clears throat> There I, there I am again, clearing my throat. If we're at the bottom of the window, it sets the Y position, fixing it at height minus 10. Remember, height increases until we, uh, we height is the, is the vertical width of the window. We go all the way down to Y minus 10 because positive Y is moving down. Y minus 10 is a point near the bottom of the window. So we, fix y to be y minus 10, and we change the state to two, indicating we're at the bottom of the window. Now we have another loop here, else if. So what's happening? We go up here, first it checks if, that's not true. We're not, we're right here, sorry. If, we're not at state zero. Now it's finished with state one, so we're not a state one. So both of these are false. So then we go to this else if. So if those two are false, keeps going through these else ifs until it finds a true one. Here state equal two is true. Now we're moving the rectangle to the left. So we're moving, we're making the X position smaller as we move to the left. So X equals X minus speed. Now we check to see if we are running off the left side of the window. If X is less than zero, then we're going to change the value of X to be zero. So that puts us right on the left edge of the window. Then we're changing the state to three. So we now, Are running along the bottom of the window. When we get all the way to the left edge of the window, states now three. So we execute this block of code. Else if state equals three. Now we're we're all the way at the end of the left um, bottom left edge. Now we want to start moving the rectangle up. That'll be state equal three. So we have state equal one, state equal zero, which is moving along the top. 
state equal one, which is moving down the right side, state equal two, which is moving across the bottom of the window. So all of these three conditions are true. Zero, I mean false. We're not in state zero, not in state one, not in state two. Now we're executing state three. This so else if state equals three, and we've just set state equal three here. If state is equal to three, it executes this. It reduces the value of y, which is actually causing the rectangle to move up. It goes all the way up to the top of the window. So if y is less than zero, it means we've just crossed the top boundary. It resets y to be zero, and then it resets the value of state to be zero. So it's sort of the a similar piece of code that we're executing several times here. Uh, as that rectangle, let me run it, runs along the top, right, bottom, left, top, right, bottom, left, and so on. So this is an example of using uh, if, then, else, if statements in processing, uh, which is a else and if and uh, else if. These are the statements that you can find in other computer languages for doing similar things. So here we're using a bool we're doing. Um, we don't actually have a Boolean variable set, but we're checking the truth of the value for the state. If state state can state here takes on zero, one, two, three. And we're checking to see what the value state is. Is it zero? Remember, a double equal sign is what we were using when we're checking the truth or false of a statement. We're not setting the value of state to be zero. We're checking to see does state equal zero. Here is does state equal one. You know, I'm not sure if I explained that earlier, that the double equal, we're not setting the value of state to a value, what we're doing is we're saying if the value of state equals one. So that's what's going on here. Double equal is used when we're checking, uh, when, we're, when we're checking the truth of this, if state equals one. Normally, when we write an equal to, we're here like for example, we're taking the value of one and putting it into the variable state. That's not happening here, which is why we use a different symbol. We use a double equal instead of a single equal. So we're checking if state equals zero. In that case, we execute this block of code here to here. We check if state equal one. If that's true, we execute this block of code here to here. If state equals zero, if state equals three. So um, the else if uh, can be very, very useful, as I, you probably are imagining. Uh, and uh, so that's how that works. OK. So let me finish um, that example, move on to the next one. Example five nine. Here I have simple gravity. Wow, what does this what does this do? So this piece of code goes all the way down to here. It's a, a sort of a it's not too long. Let me run the code so you can see what's going on here. So here, it's like we're dropping this rectangle. It hits the bottom, bounces up. It bounces up a little less high each time. See that? So it's. It's like, uh, you know, like you're dropping a ball on the floor. OK, let's see how this thing works. Okay, we have um, float x and float y. We're initializing variable values for x and y, the location of our square. 
And we initially set speed to be zero, which will be the speed with which the square moves. Now, we have a new variable that we're setting for gravity, and what I'm calling it here I have the acceleration, right? Because um, whenever you drop some, drop something, it's going faster and faster and faster because of the acceleration due to gravity. Then it bounces up the bottom and it starts coming up. And when it bounces up the bottom, uh, the speed changes direction or the direction. It's, uh, it's moving just as fast when it bounces, it changes from going down to going up. It's moving at the instant of the bounce It'll be going up just as fast as it was going down, roughly speaking. Uh, the only thing we do is we, we're going to change um, the sign on the speed variable. So when it's going down, we're looking at speed y to be positive. It bounces up the bottom. Now speed y becomes negative. OK. Now, um, notice we have all these variables to be float. Float x, float y, float speed. Float gravity, 0 0.1. OK. Now, um, noticing here, explaining why we use a small value for, uh, for this gravity number. Um, OK, now we have void, uh, void set up to set up the size of the graphics window. Void draw, we're setting the background of the, of the box to be white. We display our square. Notice that we put the rectangle in center mode. Rec mode is center here. Uh, the square is in position X and Y, and it's a 10 by 10 square. And then we change because it's moving up or down. We're cha only changing the Y coordinate. So we set Y equal to Y plus speed. And um, so this is making the, because we're adding speed to it, this is causing it to move. And then here, see what we're doing is we're changing the value speed. Speed equals speed plus gravity. Now initially, if the, if the rectangle is falling, gravity will be a positive variable, in which we've set up here to be uh, 0.1. So we slowly increase the speed by 0.1. Um, now, if the square hits the bottom, it's going to bounce. And at that point, we change the direction of speed. So we check if y is greater than height. So it's when the rectangle gets to the bottom and then the y position of the rectangle is greater than the height of the square. Is the height the 270 here? The height is um, yeah like the size uh, right. like the second variable yes yeah okay so um so if y is greater than height we're going to bounce off the bottom and when that happens we're going to we're going to change the the uh, uh change gravity now gravity is still pulling down, but the square is starting to move up. So we're going to be reducing the speed by gravity rather than increasing the speed by gravity. So, and um, so we multiply, so that means coming up here and gravity will be reduced uh, and we do that by slowing the speed down right in here. So we have speed is equal to speed times um, negative 0 0.95. So we're changing speed to a negative number. And um, by and if we're not just 
we're not multiplying it by negative one. We're multiplying it by negative 0.95, so almost by negative one. Now, my suggestion right here is that you execute the program and try changing some of these variables. There's no uh, rule as to whether this should be 0.95 or 0.9 or 0.8, and you're going to be changing uh, the dynamics of what's happening just by changing the values of these variables. So multiplying by negative 0.95 instead of negative one slows the square down each time it bounces. So we're not only going to be changing the sign on speed, but we're going to be slowing the square down when it bounces. So you see there's a slight loss of speed here when it bounces, which is typically what would happen if a ball bounces. OK, as I said, you know, you can it, it typically comes. It starts moving back up almost exactly the same speed that it had when it was moving down just at the instant of the bounce, except some energy is absorbed in the bounce. So the ball will slow down just a little bit. So that's what this is accounting for. We're changing the value of speed, we're changing the sign, and we're slowing the ball down just a little bit because of the bounce. Okay, and um, then we re then we're and we're resetting the value of y. Here we said if y is greater than height, that's when we execute this block. So it's just when that when the ball or the the rectangle in this case just passes the bottom of the window. We're going to reset it so that it's right at the bottom. We've changed the value of speed, and now we're going to start moving the ball back up. So it slows down every time it bounces. Now, let's just try, let me just, you know, let me just show you this again, and then I'm, so you see, it's not even obvious that it's slowing down a bit, other than the fact that it doesn't go up exactly as high as when it started. Now, let me close this. Let me change this to 5-5 five, five. there. Let's see what happens. It'll be like it's on the moon or something. No, no, that's not on the moon. <clears throat> that's like a, a big that's, ball of putty. Yeah. Uh, before that, uh, I have a question. Yeah. When you run the program, it was bouncing, but then at the second bounce, it didn't reach the bottom. Why? Let or me, at least it seemed like that. Well, I don't, let me look at it again. You, you may not be getting all the frames uh, in the video here that you're watching, you know, because uh, uh, because the uh, uh, the the software for doing the video, the lecture might reduce the frames that it's sending. So it may just look like that. I think it's hitting the bottom all the way. Yep, on mine, it's going all the way to the bottom. I think you you might just be missing frames in the video that you're looking at there. So oh, OK, because uh, every second bounce is just not reaching. Yeah, okay. it, it really is. You just it's just not sending that frame over uh, over teams. OK, so. Now. Uh, so that's pretty interesting. Now. Um, now what we have here is actually kind of a. A, um, a, a simplification of the physics of a bouncing ball. Now people do uh, make computer games and the computer games involve things moving in gravity. Um, in computer gaming, they actually have a whole section of code that's called uh, the physics. And for projectiles and gravity and, and bouncing and everything, all of this is handled by a piece of code that is specifically intended just to handle the physics of of things in the, in the game program to kind of make it seem so that it's 
somewhat realistic. So indeed, uh, we uh, in in games we have this whole physics engine, as it's sometimes called, which deals with things like gravity, projectile motion, bounces, and everything else. So here, for example, unreal. It's an unreal. engine. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And. Um, OK, so there uh, that's that piece of code. Uh, and um, where we're dealing with something simple uh, or treating gravity in a simple way. OK, don't save. OK, now let's see. You now 510. Now I have our old buddy Zug again here well, let's let's just look at see what the code does let's run it and then we'll go back and look at it line by line so here we have zoog look at that now it reminds so, me of lg icons uh, yeah 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 so this is also very similar if you remember the Pong game I showed you where we had a ball bouncing and hitting paddles. So Zoog is bouncing up the sides, uh, similar to how that was done. OK, so let's look here at how we get Zoog to do this. Bounce off top and bottom and so on of these boxes. Now notice that Zoog has speed in the X direction and Y direction here. So up until now, we were only changing things just in the X direction or just in the Y direction. Here, Zoog has both. So that's one compli additional complication. Now, if you look at this, at, uh, if we wanted to, uh, we could actually complicate this even more by adding gravity to this. So we would be changing the speed in the Y direction um, so that as Zoog were moving up, we would change the speed in the Y direction to cause him you know, to come around like this, if you can imagine that. So you could, uh, you could take some of the complications from the previous pieces of code and add them in here to add a little gravity on this if you so chose. Hey, let me turn this off. Okay, what's going on here? Well, okay, we X and Y will typically be, let's say, in this case, the position of Zoog. Um, w and H are going to be a height and width values exactly how we're going to use them down here we'll see setting the eye size to be 16 so zoog has the variable speed in the horizontal and vertical directions and notice that the speed in the x direction is three and we make the speed in the y direction as one now if they were both the same when Zoog moved, he would move at a 45 degree angle. But making them not the same causes Zoog to move. See, when he's moving, he's not moving at a 45 degree angle. And that's handled by the speed in the X and Y direction. So let's look at this. Suppose they're both equal to one. So we make both speeds the same. And this is Zoog moving in 45. Set it back to three. There we go. So he's at any given instant of time is moving further in the X direction than in the Y direction, which changes the angle of his trajectory. Okay, now 
we set the size of our graphics window. And then right off here, you see we're changing. Um, X by X speed and Y by Y speed. And we put in an if statement or logical or determines if Zug has reached either the right or left edge of the screen. When this is true, we multiply the speed by negative one. In other words, we change the direction of the motion. And so uh, speed will be either positive or negative, and we change it every time he hits an edge of the screen. If he hits the right edge, we're changing the X speed. If he hits the bottom edge, we're going to change the the Y speed and similarly for the for the other edges. So reversing Zug's direction is if X is greater than width. Or that's an or X is less than zero. We're going to change the sign on speed. So X equals X speed times negative one. So the speed has the same magnitude, but we're changing the direction. OK, so. Similarly, if he hits the top and bottom, we change the Y speed. If Y is greater than height or Y less than zero, we're changing the Y speed by multiplying it by negative one. OK, we're redrawing the window. Background is 255. Now we're really setting up Zug to draw Zug's body. We have the ellipse mode at center, rec mode at center. Now we've drawn Zug's body before. You know, and you can go through this as you know, doing everything. Zug's body, Zug's head, Zug's eyes, Zug's eggs. OK, and notice that all of these positions depend on values of X and Y. And it's X and Y are the variables that are changing as we move Zug left and right and up and down. OK, so all so these just set the relative positions of the body, the head, the eyes and the legs. And then we're changing the value of Y and X to cause Zug to move to the right or the left and so on. And let me let me do this again and run it. So. There we go. And um, so you're beginning to see uh, the something like this was used in setting up the Pong game. Now, when we did Pong, let me run this again. We had our paddles. So instead of bouncing off the, the left and right edges of the window, we had paddles which moved, and we made it so we bounced off the the paddle, the front edge. So the paddle was just a rectangle, went something like this, and we would bounce our ball off the front edge of the paddle here, and the that would be the right edge of the paddle here, and the left edge of the paddle here. So instead of bouncing off the boundaries of the box, we would bounce off the paddle. And then if the ball missed the paddle, we would stop running the program and we would increment the score by one to indicate that the score has changed. So that Pong game um, is, uh, this is almost, but not quite, the, uh, the entire Pong game, actually. Okay, now. So that's our lesson five. Let's look at lesson six here. Processing. I have a question. Yeah. Is it possible uh, to make a Pac-Man game in Processing 3? Oh, yeah. In fact, my guess is that um, you could um, um, May somebody may have done that. Uh, let you know. Let's just uh, go into my uh, browser and let's just Google Pac-Man in processing. Okay. 
Spoof a Pac-Man game for processing two and three. Pac-Man, open processing. Here. So let's just look here, see what that says. Well, I mean, it, it doesn't look like a full Pac-Man game, but we come back. Spoof a Pac-Man. I mean, like, can we assign a uh, keyboard to the function like for example when you press press keyboards uh keys on the keyboard like you move the pac-man is it yeah. possible in processing oh yeah yeah remember we uh earlier in one of the examples we showed that you we what we did was we made it so you can press a key and when you press a key um it printed out in the, in the bottom of the window what key you pressed. Well, that's because we just had to do a print statement when we pressed the key. We could press a key um, in, um, and instead of just printing out the value of the key, we could um, have that be the up and down and left and right arrows, for instance, or um, when I did Pac-Man, I think I, uh, not Pac-Man, sorry, Pong, I think I had the W and S key um, moved the paddle up and down. So I pressed keys to move the paddle in, uh, in my Pong game. So you can write it so that a key press, instead of printing something out, a key press will cause something to move like like Pac-Man. So, see, spoof of Pac-Man game for project. I don't, here it is right here. So there's something. So, it looks like here's another one yet, even down here. There's this thing. It looks like there's some YouTube videos to describe someone who's done a Pac-Man game in processing. So yes, you can do Pac-Man in processing. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so. Um, Let's, uh, we're, we have a, another new um, uh, technique here, a very important technique in writing code, uh, and that is uh, doing for loops or while loops. And uh, so the most complicated thing that we've done up until this point might be uh, doing the if statements if then, if then else, and so on. The, and though the if statements are really important in making interesting code, and the loops are also very important in doing interesting code. And um, so I'm going to talk about doing loops, uh, but this might be just a minute. Let me just take a little break. I'm almost done doing the sample final exam. Um, and uh, let's just see. I think that the uh, the final week goes something like December seventeenth to the twenty fourth, or something like that. Um, no, I said I would give you actually the actual final as a take home the week before final week, so you don't have to worry about the take home final while you're doing finals and other courses. And uh, so the week before, if final week is like 17 to 24, the week before that is 10 to 17. And if I give you the sample final, the week before I give you the final, 
that would be next week. So when I get the sample final to you, I might email it to you. Now, I also have put some of these program codes on the Moodle. So I uh, took all of the, the all of the processing software codes we've been going over, and I put them in a folder. I compressed the folder, and then I put it on the Moodle. And I don't know. I I don't. I haven't got all the latest codes on there, but I posted things on the Moodle for this codes we've been doing. Now, like I said, I'm almost done with the sample final. And I'll probably be sending that to you later this week um, by email or and or posting it on the Moodle so you can see it. OK, now. So, yeah, we're quickly running down to the uh, end of the semester here. OK, let's look at this. Well, all I'm going to do here in this piece of code is I'm going to draw a bunch of lines. I think these are all vertical lines, I recall. Uh, I drew them, and uh, so let me just run this so you can see. So there we are. That's a bunch of vertical lines. Now here I had to actually write out the the command for drawing each of these lines individually. And sometimes in a piece of code that we write, we m might want to have a lot of things, a lot of variations on the same idea. And we don't necessarily have to want to write an individual code, piece of line of code for each item. Uh, and this is what we use loops for, for helping to avoid having to do this. There's no loop in this code right here. All we're doing is just setting up the window, the background, the stroke, drawing a bunch of vertical lines, and that's it. Not very fancy code. So many lines. Now let's go look at the next piece of code. Many lines too. OK, now. This looks even more complicated. Not sure that we're saving anything here. Let's look at this. Set up our window. Initialize some variables as integers. Integer y, integer x, integer spacing, integer length. So spacing will be the distance between the, ver the lines. Length um, will be the length of the line. And this is, uh, as you say, draw the first leg. We're drawing a line, goes from X and Y. And the first point is X, Y. Second point is X and Y plus length. So we're putting a point at the top and drawing a line down to a second point down here. Then we add spacing to the X coordinate. And then we draw the line again down here. Then we add spacing to the X coordinate again. And then we draw another line. Add spacing to the X coordinate. So here we draw our set of lines by having this same command for drawing the line as here. Notice that and this are exactly the same statements as is this. So we don't have to have different parameter values inside the command for drawing the line. What we do is we change the X values. So we use the same code here, but just changing the X values and drawing the line. So even though this looks like it's a much more complicated piece of code than the previous one, we don't have to figure out different values for X and Y to draw each individual line. We actually use the same command in the code and we're changing X and Y values. So I, I would claim that this is actually easier piece of code um, 
from that perspective. Let's run it. So it looks like it's drawing almost the same thing here. So it looks the same, but it's done in a completely different way here. OK, but we still haven't gotten to the idea of having a loop yet. We're still having to put an individual command for every line. Let me come back. While loop. Now, typically there are two kinds of loops in computer codes. They're what are called while loops and they're what are called for loops. And frequently in some applications, which one you decide to use uh, is interchangeable. You can do the same kind of thing with a for loop that you might be able to do with a while loop. Not every application can you do, do you have a choice of one or the other, but in many applications, you can just decide to use a while loop or a for loop. Now, this is a while loop first, and this is a much shorter piece of code than our previous. So we will call this example while loop. We set up our graphics window, set up values for X and Y, spacing and length. OK, a variable to mark where the legs end, integer and legs 150. Stroke, and now I'll look at this in a minute, but let's just run the code. So there we go, there's our code. So this looks like, again, it's almost, the, it does almost exactly the same thing. Here the window's a little bit different size, I think, which we could fix. Uh, up here with size. Now, let's look at this. Draw each leg inside a while loop. So what are we doing? We have a while x is less than or equal to n legs. So again, this is a statement checking the truth or falseness of this while. So as long as this statement is true, this block of code from here to here will be executed. When this statement is not true, this whole thing, if this is not true, then this block of code is not executed. So this is, says while X is less than or equal to N legs. So as long as the X position where we're drawing the line is less than end legs. We're going to be we're going to be drawing a line. However, when this is violated, when X becomes greater than end legs, we don't draw the line. OK, so what's going on here? If X is less than end legs, we're drawing this line. So we draw the line. Then we come back and we change the value of X. So what's happening here, this while loop, remember when we did draw, I said draw just executes over and over and over and over again. That's what's happening with a while loop. A while executes over and over and over again. So as long as this is true, as long as this statement is true, this block of code will execute, then it'll come back. We're changing the X value. Then it comes back and it checks the new X value. If the new X value still allows this statement to be true, then it executes the block of code again, where the X value is again changed. Comes back up, checks the new X value. If this is true, it does the block of code again. So this piece of code here keeps executing over and over and over again as long as X is less than or equal to end legs. We keep increasing the value of X. At some point, this will not be true. When this is not true, that, that section of code will stop executing. So that's what's going on here. So let me draw this, you see draws the first line, 
increments the value of x. X is still less than or equal to n legs. Draws the second line, increments the value of x. So it keeps changing the value of x value till it gets up here. And then as soon as x becomes greater than the value of n legs, it stops executing that block of code. So that is how this is working. Now, uh, the uh, one of the dangers that you can run into with a while loop is that you might have an error in your code. And um, in which case, this statement might turn out to never be false. And if st this statement is never false, then what happens is this while loop keeps going on forever and your code um, you know, I, won't, I won't say it won't it doesn't lock up but it never stops executing it can execute forever and that situation is called an infinite loop and um, indeed um, before Apple computer moved into their new building which is like a huge flying saucer shape. Um, their address was one infinite loop way uh, in Cupertino, California. And I, I visited there a few times. And uh, so uh, infinite loop refers to this, to usually a mistake in a program where a while loop never terminates. It never reaches a false condition. It's called an infinite loop. OK, so here's an example of using a while loop. Now, I think I, I give you some examples of infinite loops. Let's look here. So this is. I have a question. Yeah. Is there any difference between a for loop and while loop? I mean, they're basically the same, no? I mean, well, there is a difference. And uh, uh, and I'll, I'll be getting to that. I haven't gotten to the for loop yet, but typically for loops, um, you don't have infinite for loops because for loops have a very definite termination point. That's one of the big differences. Where a while loop can execute indefinitely. So while loops may not have a fixed termination point. Like with for loop, you, you'll go like for i equal, for i less than 100, and you keep incrementing the value of i every time through the loop. And as soon as i gets to 100, the loop stops. While loops, you can get, you can have an infinite, you can have an infinite for loop too, but you're much less likely to have an infinite for loop. So as I said in the beginning, frequently you can, you have a choice. You can use either a for loop or a while loop. Now, I'm going to talk about for loops in a minute, but let's look at this. Infinite loop. Don't do this. So here's the code. Um, and let me, uh, let's look at this. We have integer x equals zero. While x is less than 10, we're going to print out x. Now, but we're going to make x smaller every time through the loop. So x starts off as zero, and then we keep making it um, x equals x minus one. So what's going on? Decrement. What? Are we decrementing it, like lessening it by one each time? Yeah. Let's run this. Now, we're not printing out anything. Um, so, uh, the only, I mean, the only thing we hear, we're doing the graphics window. This line quits the loop so that the sketch does not crash. What line? Uh, this is called a break. And uh, uh, so, if the break, when a code is executing, so it's executing this, 
print log print line you know, and it, each value of x gets printed on a new line it decrements x making it smaller but x will always be less than 10. so this code never executes i mean never stops executing because x is always less than 10. so now by adding the break statement here we're preventing the code from running forever because soon as the execution of the program gets to break it will stop that's what break is used for break is to stop the execution of the code and um, so this is a loop a while loop that never the the terminating condition uh, the, the condition which causes the while loop to, to stop is never met. So this would go on forever and ever and ever unless we have the break statement. So this is an example of an infinite loop. We could take out break. There, right there. So I no longer have the break statement. I run. Notice here it's running and running and running and it just keeps on going okay this is printing out x on a new line now i am going to have to turn this off don't say why did i stop button there no what's that there was a stop button there no that uh, square um, is right. it not a stop button? This, yes. Um, now um, if we have break in there. What happens? So here it executes. Here we run the code. It doesn't go on forever. Okay, and um, because the break statement stops it. OK, now let's see, this is 6.4. I'm just about out of time, I think. Um, yeah, 6.57. So uh, remember, we pick up with 6.5 next class. Another infinite loop. It might be a good place to pick up here. Um, OK. So um, yes, um, we'll pick this up next class, and I will get the um, uh, sample exam finished and get it out to you so you can look at it. And then the week after next, I will give you the final exam for that week that you can work on. And um, and uh, I think that's that's all I want to. That's all I have to say right now. Let me. Get out of this. OK. OK, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Yeah, sure. Th thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. -bye. bye.